Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for getting here early. Uh, we had over 200 RSVPs, so we did want to make sure that we let folks know that we might not have seats for everyone. There's about 140 seats capacity. We're starting right on time to make sure that folks. Put the microphone up. We're going to start right on time so that folks who got here early and on time, louder. even louder. Not good enough. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, for other speakers, make sure to speak right into the microphone. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone who got here early. And now we're a little bit too loud with some feedback. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, we wanted to put together a forum on super scrapers and what we can do to fight them. Uh, we're joined by a great panel, and we have a whole lot of sponsors. But uh, and one thing to note is we're filming this; it will be placed online. All of you should have gotten that by email, so uh, please do so. Also, you have some cards, so please make sure to fill those out with any questions. Uh, but before we go any further, uh, we're joined today by some of our sponsors, a st our state senator, Liz Kruger, as well as council member, Dan Rodnick, of whom I serve uh, on the other side. And so we're going to have to say a couple of words. representing uh, District 28, most of the east side, some runs across Midtown. I'm just here to say thank you to my colleagues in government for being so interested in doing something about this, what I see as a true crisis facing us here in Manhattan. We don't want to be Shanghai. No. No, we are not intended to be Shanghai. We need to plan for our future in a much better way. So I want to thank so much Ben Kalos for all the work he's been doing on this and the commitment he has made to try to solve this problem, working with smart people like those you're going to hear from tonight. And I also want to thank another partner in the city council I love doing work with, Dan Grodnick, who I'm about to bring up, who's also been an amazing ally on this and so many issues. So. I know we're all going to learn a lot, and I'm going to say goodbye and introduce Council Member Dan Gronick. Thank you, Senator Kruger, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as you heard, my name is Dan Gronick, and I have uh, the great privilege of serving the City Council uh, in the district right next to Council Member Kalos. Um, and just for your reference, I'm from 14th Street up to 97th Street and I border Ben on the west, and in the Sutton area, I've got a couple of blocks, 54 and 55, um, and uh, I have been representing the 4th District for about 10 years. Um, and I wanted to be here tonight to uh, express my, uh, my support for Councilmember Kalos in having this conversation with the great panel that he has assembled, and also to raise the obvious concern about what is happening out there um, this conversation is new to those who are looking at the issue. Some, some people, for the first time on 58th Street, we have been dealing with this challenge over the past couple of years in the West 50s, uh, where you're dealing with uh, the commercial super towers that are causing shadows on Central Park or 432 Park Avenue. Many people are surprised to learn that these buildings did not require one iota of public review, public consideration, public authority to be able to proceed. Uh, and it raises obvious public policy questions for all of us as to what the rules here should be. Should we allow uh, the unfettered development of super tall buildings where they may have real impacts on parks and communities? Uh, at what point should we require public consideration or review of those buildings. Uh, how do you measure impacts on a community? How do you measure impacts on historic resources? Um, these are hard questions to answer, frankly. Uh, we have real estate land use professionals who are grappling with this issue right now. 
We're struggling with some of these questions in this midtown. We're struggling with them in the West 50s. But as Senator Kruger said, we don't want to be Shanghai. We want to make sure that our development is in the context of what we have and what we want to be. And we don't want the tail wagging the dog here when it comes to our planning. We set the rules and the real estate community follows the rules and we move on from there. I just will make one note and then I will pass the microphone back to Councilmember Michaela, is that we are looking at ways within the city council to draft rules separate and apart from the land use process, the zoning process, to require a little more transparency when there are these zoning lot mergers and where there's an opportunity for people to combine lots and suddenly build uh, extraordinary towers like what we are seeing proposed over and over and over again. So this is a live issue, so thank you to Councilmember Kalos for bringing us together, and thank you all and to the panel for being here to participate tonight. Thank you. Thank you to Senator Kruger and uh, Councilmember Borodnik. The elected officials on the east side really work as a team, and uh, they've been here a little bit longer than me, and it's been a pleasure to be working with them. And, uh, the only thing, reason we get as much as we do done is because we do work as a team, so if we could just give the team one round of applause. Thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the co-sponsors for this event. Can everyone hear me in back? Perfect. I will. Our co-sponsors include our Congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney, the New York City Public Advocate, Letitia James, the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, and if Jesus from her office could just stand up and give away. Uh, so there's Jesus, and we'd like to thank him for being here. We are uh, also sponsored by uh, State Senator Jose Serrano, who actually has the northern part of the Upper East Side. Uh, we're also sponsored by Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright, and her Chief of Staff, Callie, is here with us. If Callie could stand up, and if we could welcome her. We're also sponsored by Assemblymember Dan Court, Assemblymember Robert Rodriguez. Uh, you just heard from Councilmember Gorodnik. Uh, this was also sponsored by Community Board 8, and that's actually been the focus of this, as well as Community Board 11, which I represent, and is facing similar land use uh, issues. They actually have three 50-story buildings that are slated for development in their area, as well as Community Board 5, and we thank them for their leadership. And uh, last but not least, uh, we are co-sponsored by the East River 50s Alliance. So if we can just thank all of our sponsors for getting the word out and being on board. One key item is uh, you don't have to wait for events like this if you want to see me. Uh, we do a first Friday, the first Friday of every month from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m except in August when I need to take a vacation, so we're moving it to August 14th. So Friday, August 14th, I'm happy to sit down with you face to face and talk about what's important. We also have a policy night for people who'd like to make policies and laws. That is the second Tuesday of every month. That's at 6 p.m. and that will be on August 11th. So I hope to see you there. So tonight we're trying to share with people in Board 8 some of the lessons we've learned so far in Board 6. So if I just show it, show of hands, how many of you live south of 59th Street? Okay, and how many of you live north of 59th Street? Okay, so we have about equal distribution. Uh, and so I want to share the lessons of what's happening south of 59th Street, what we've been able to do in Board 6. For those of you who don't know, uh, our city is split up into 59 community districts. Uh, they aren't related to population, they're just geographic areas. So Board 6 is from 59th to, I believe, 14th Street, and Board 8 is from 59th to 96th Street, uh, and both are east of 5th Avenue. And so what has happened is we've seen the proliferation of the tall buildings along 57th Street, and they were doing so largely in commercial districts, but Sutton area is fully residential, it's a very different part of the neighborhood. And then we've also started to see increased development up the Upper East Side. So the Upper East Side, Community District 8, is already the densest census tract in America. Uh, we are the most concentrated, we have the most people living vertically on top of each other. 
Uh, and that's why we're building the Second Avenue subway. That that being said, God willing, when it's built in December of 2016, it will still be near capacity, and the four, five, six will still be over capacity. And so that being said, we're building, and we're building, and we're building. And uh, if you look out your windows, you'll notice at night that none of the lights in the neighborhood are on anymore, especially along Second Avenue. So people have noticed that there's some assemblages starting at 72nd Street and 2nd. There's assemblages starting at 79th Street and 1st. There's other assemblages happening throughout the neighborhood, and we need to act quickly. So what happened is on 58th Street and York, which is very residential, most of the buildings are 75 feet or uh, 210 feet. Some of them are a little bit taller, but it's mostly residential. A uh, developer named Bauhaus came in and uh, they bought a couple of buildings and they decided they wanted to put up a 90-story building. That information made its way to me through a constituent, and I'll be honest, elected officials are not all-knowing. I wish we were. Uh, but the reason we know so much is because people like every one of you in the audience are our eyes and ears and letting us know what's going on. So please continue to have an open line of communications and report what's happening. So when I got their offering manual, the first thing I did, and usually what the elected official might do is reach out, talk to the developer, and then say, oh, it says it's right. But we decided to do something different. So we shared it, we tried to share it with the media. The, the Times wasn't interested, but we decided to put it in our local press, which is one of the better newspapers, Our Town. Raise your hand if you're an Our Town reader. If you're not, you should read it. It's the best way to find out what's happening in the neighborhood, other than in, our, in my newsletter. And so uh, we put it out in Our Town. Um, I put out an opinion editorial against it, and we were able to work with um, Sutton Area Community uh, to organize a petition. We got over 2,000 signatures in the span of weeks. Uh, CV6 moved very quickly, had a hearing, passed a resolution, and uh, the community is already organized as the East River 50s Alliance, and we're moving forward with an EAS and a Euler, and hopefully we can get this done before the end of the summer. Um, one thing is, if you're interested in supporting, we need more people to uh, join the coalition. And so what I'm hoping is, given the success we're seeing down there, above 59th Street, we really don't have that coalition built yet. And we need all of our neighbors to start getting together, and all of the co-op and condo boards, and the rental buildings to start getting together, and the neighborhood associations, and the community board to get together to say, we need some context. We do not want the 650-foot building that's going in on 88th and 3rd, and I promise you it's the first of many. We want to make sure that we keep some context in the neighborhood. We want to keep light and air. We want to live in this neighborhood that we grew up in, that we've made what it is, and we get to deserve to stay and have that light and air. So I've asked some experts to come and uh, share. So tonight we're joined by Margaret Newman, Executive Director of the Municipal Arts Society, She's going to tell you a little bit of what's been happening about the accidental skyline report that they've put together. Uh, we have Tara Kelly, Executive Director of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, as well as Emma Marconi, Bologna Executive Director of City Talks, who will talk to everyone about uh, zoning, explaining what the different districts are and how zoning has been used to protect our city in the past. We have Terrence O'Neill, CB6 Land Use Chair, who can go over the role of the community board, what his board did, and how your board can take similar actions. And then we have Dieter Selig, who is president of the Sutton Area Community. Uh, and he's going to share about how they organized their membership in the East River 50s Alliance, their update. And uh, tonight's call to action is simply, development is as a right, but we as a community get to determine those rights. We get to make those laws. And when you have a council member and a borough president and a community board that stands with you in the community and says that this is what we want, that's a force to be reckoned with and we do have the power to change our laws. It's been done before and we need to do it again. So I'd like to now call on Margaret Newman to please join us. If you could give her a warm welcome.
Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, at, thank you, Councilmember Member Kalos, and um, to my fellow panelists, and thank you all for um, having me here this evening. Um, I'm a topic I'm really excited to talk about, and I've uh, been with MAS for about a year and a half, and I've talked about this topic fairly endlessly, so it's, it's a really important one, and I think, I just want to explain for a minute the accidental skyline and the notion of this, which started um, uh, when the organization took a look at what was happening on 57th Street and realized that there were about to be six enormous towers built along 57th Street and nobody actually realized that they were about to be built. Uh, they had been, um, as um, Councilmember Garabnik mentioned, uh, they were all built as of right and they were a surprise. So we called it the accidental skyline because it certainly wasn't something that was intentional. Um, I think it's important, first of all, to um, look at the history of New York when you're talking about skyscrapers. Um, this is obviously a skyscraper town, and particularly Manhattan. And so for 125 years, we've been building some pretty big buildings. Um, Ada Louise Huxtable once said, when asked what a New York City skyscraper should be, answered, soaring, shining, and glamorous an affirmation of reach and power. And individually, tall buildings stand as emblems of some of New York's most defining architectural styles, a record of our, our political and um, our power, uh, record of power and history in the city. And some of our most defining uh, buildings on the skyline, as you're all very familiar with, are things like the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, and uh, many of the buildings that uh, we have a huge amount of uh, tourism that comes to New York, tourists who come to New York to visit and see these things. Um, so collectively, uh, the skyscrapers comprise our, it's frequently changing skyline, and there's, oops, not ready for that one yet. Um, and tall buildings are an important part of the city's heritage and also our future economic success. So we need to think carefully about how and where this type of development happens in the city, and also to think about our collective resources which all of these buildings impact, which means our open spaces, our parks, and as all of you here are a kind of testament to, uh, we have to think about our neighborhoods, make sure they're improved and not compromised by what we build. So just a little bit of uh, history on NAS's activism on this topic. Um, some of you may remember this if you've been around the city for um, since the 80s. Whoops, why is this doing this? Um, so at Columbus Circle, MAS was instrumental in the 80s in, in fighting against the proposal for the Coliseum site. Um, this was a Moshe Safdie project which mercifully did not get built. Um, and I think a better proposal, which is the current Time Warner Center, was built. Um, and as part of this a campaign against this, um, MAS organized the Stand Against the Shadow event where hundreds of people with black umbrellas stood in the area of the park, which was going to be shadowed by the proposed tower. And there is an important dis uh, distinction to note between um, this project and some of the towers we're talking about now. Um, the project at, um, uh, at the Coliseum site was not an as-of-right project. In other words, uh, the protests could be effective um, the challenges to it could be affected because it was a city and state-owned site and it did require public review. Many of the things, as both Ben and Dan mentioned, um, the buildings that we're talking about today were built with no public review and uh, the developers were entitled to build them in what we call as of right. Um, so just a quick summary of what we're going to be looking at over the next, some of these are already uh, underway, if not well completed, and I think you're familiar with them. Um, and so the, this is the uh, parade across 57th Street, um, some on 53rd Street that will be um, built over the next few years. And um, we have some new ways of demonstrating impacts of development, and the Accidental Skyline Report, these are images from that um, report, uh, bring attention to these towers along 57th Street. and. So the, the question becomes, uh, there's a couple of them. One is, why do these buildings get built? 
And I think we can answer that, that there's incredibly um, soaring market demand for luxury condos. And uh, developers are simply um, capitalizing on this um, market for high-end residential towers uh, that offer the best views in the city. Uh, the other thing that is happening right now is that advances in building technology have allowed for extraordinarily tall buildings to be built on very narrow sites. So um, we'll probably hear later about how sites are um, put together in order to allow um, accumulate uh, sufficient development rights to build these towers. But um, the regulations that were written, the zoning regulations that control this building, were put together in back in the 60s um, before these slow, tall, slender buildings were possible. So um, in theory, the only thing limiting the height, there are no height restrictions on 57th Street and in, in also some of the areas around here. So the only thing really that's technically limiting these are building construction issues and FAA regulations. So think about that one. Um, so this is uh, just to show you a height comparison of some of the new buildings as opposed to uh, the darker buildings on, on the left-hand side of the screen are some of the ones that you're familiar with, and then the, the ones on the right. Um, as you can see, there are a number of them that are well over a thousand feet. Um, and uh, the One World Trade is over that. The Chrysler Building is, with its spire, is about a thousand feet, just as a note of comparison. Um, so one of the things that's de uh, demonstrated in the report that we put together were the uh, effect of shadows on parks. Um, this is Central Park, and, and the um, shows the development on September 21st, um, um, prior to development, and these show them on the far right is uh, later in the day, 4 p.m., when the shadows are longest, but as you can see, if you toggle between the two, that there is um, substantial increase. Um, so this could continue, obviously, and uh, uh, it's not probably a, an impact that we all want to see. Um, so following the release of the report, uh, we started asking the question, where else in the city might this happen? Because once towers are approved and they're as of right, they're going up, there's really not a whole lot that can be done um, at that point. So first of all, you need to figure out where they might get built. And so there's a number of factors that determine that. Um, this is a um, all of these green spots are um, the various parks in Manhattan, obviously Central Park being the largest. Um, so, so where are you not likely to see towers? Well, landmarks, um, historic districts are, uh, have limits on them um, because of the types of review and the contextual uh, rules that are set down. So you're not likely to see these tall towers in uh, landmark, um, e either on landmark sites or in historic districts although some of these towers use air rights that are transferred from the landmark buildings. Um, you are likely to see it around transportation hubs. Uh, Manhattan is one of the most transportation-rich um, cities in the world, or New York City, and then Manhattan has a very dense uh, uh, grid of subways. Um, and so high-density development is uh, often allowed and encouraged in places where there is good transit. Um, this is a um, uh, diagram that shows where the um, areas of um, commercial floor area are allowed as of right, and obviously the, you can see the red areas are the densest areas. Uh, and again, this does tend to uh, follow the, where the transit um, areas are. Um, these are the areas that showing where some of the residential um, areas are permitted and to build as of right. Um, the, the bright red is uh, a 12 FAR and hopefully late, I'm not gonna go into that right now, I'm hoping some of my colleagues will talk a little bit about that um, later on. So this just, just, give just gives you an, an idea of where um, both commercial and residential may occur. Um, this is a diagram that I think really kind of explains a lot of what's going on. This is not a picture of buildings, although it looks like it. Um, this is a diagram that represents land value. So as you can see, the area in midtown Manhattan, closest to the park uh, and some in your neighborhood, is where the city has um, this is, uh, assessed land value for tax lots in Manhattan. 
And um, so the relative values explain a lot about why you might want to build bigger buildings in places where the land values are very, very high in order to recoup the, um, not only the cost of the development, but also to make it um, worthwhile for, and from a profitable profit standpoint. Um, this is the link on our website where you can uh, take a look at the um, a report. And you can also click on, uh, we have a map that's clickable to see uh, what are the available development rights on, on any piece of property in the five boroughs. So that's kind of fun to play with. Um, so all of these elements together um, give us a sense of where the next generation of super towers might appear. And so what can we do about this? And I think Dan uh, Garodnik summarized this pretty well, but I'm just going to go through this quickly before I close. Um, some recommendations are rethinking height and setback controls around open spaces to allow new development but also protect our parks. Placing restrictions on large lot assemblages in cases where more than 20% of the site's base FAR is exceeded, uh, additional public review might be required. And then this is a um, photo of 57th Street, the Calvary Baptist Church, which may be uh, the site for uh, another zoning lot merger, Extel, uh, it's just up the block from 157. Um, and uh, zoning lot mergers are not reported in a straightforward manner, so there's really no way to tell what's going on, so that transparency piece is really important. Um, Nordstrom Tower, which will probably be the tallest building in Manhattan when it's finished on 57th Street, um, and it did not undergo any public review. So there might be a consideration for buildings over a certain height undergoing public review. Um, the other thing that uh, I think is important to talk about is, um, this is a picture of Hudson Yards before anything was built on it, and it's an example of uh, something called value capture, where we, um, uh, we from development um, uh, dollars that then can be used to pay for supporting infrastructure. And I think that um, this is a, an example of upzoning, which is, you know, if a, if a new tower is going in your neighborhood and you're going to get a new, uh, several new parks, you're going to get all, all kinds of benefits for your neighborhood, you tend to look differently at, at the proposal. Um, I think we also it's important to talk about that we worry about height a great deal, uh, and I think it's also, um, you want to think about what density means, because some of these tall towers are not actually um, providing uh, density, they're, they're providing fewer units there than what was taken away. Um, so, just to summarize quickly, um, New York needs to do a better job of connecting and permitting new development, uh, providing and with providing the necessary infrastructure. And we need to ask as a city, when is a super tower worth it? So here's some ideas. When it contributes positively to the sidewalk, the public realm, and the skyline. When it is a financial plus for the city, bringing new jobs and new tax revenue. When it helps directly support the infrastructure needed to support growth. And when the building is thoughtfully integrated with the surrounding context. And I think if a new development does not satisfy at least a few of these criteria, then the answer to the question, is this super tower worth it, is likely to be no. Thank you very much. Thank you to Margaret Newman for uh, the Municipal Art Society for a presentation. I think that gives everybody a good idea of what we're seeing on 57th Street, what we're likely to see, and uh, what is coming down the pipe. Uh, is everyone was able everyone able to hear uh, Margaret in her presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so one piece is I've uh, been asked to remind everyone if you could just hold up your cards for writing down questions. Uh, just hold them up. So if you Okay, perfect. If you need a card to write down questions, if you raise your hand, somebody from my office will come and bring your card. Just keep them up, and uh, we will, uh, Sushant will make sure we get you some cards, so if you can be patient, keep your hands up. Please write down your questions as you go. When you are ready to have your card collected, raise your hand, and somebody from my office will come pick it up, and we'll be collecting it so that after these presentations we can engage in a uh, Q&A. So I'd like to now call up uh, Emma Marconi Bologna from CB Cost. She's going to talk about a history of zoning in New York. 
which means over the next 10 minutes you will become an expert on zoning. So if we can give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I'm going to give an abbreviated history of zoning in New York, and also uh, discuss how Civitas has changed zoning on the Upper East Side of East Harlem since 1981. You're not being heard. Uh, zoning is a three-dimensional blueprint for our city. It determines the size and use of our buildings. And as early as the 1870s and 1880s, New Yorkers began to protest about the loss of light and air. As a response, the state enacted a series of height restrictions, and, these, and further laws were put in place when the 38-story equitable building was constructed in Lower Manhattan in 1915. The building cast a seven-acre shadow on the surrounding neighborhood. This was really a time of widespread change in the community. Uh, building techniques and elevators allowed for taller structures. Tenements were being constructed to their maximum bulk to accommodate for uh, new waves of incoming immigrants. And factor, there was an increase in factories and manufacturing, which led to the urgency of zoning reforms. New York's 1916 zoning resolution was the nation's first comprehensive zoning uh, code, and it was a model for other cities throughout the country. It established height and setback controls and excluded incompatible uses like factories from residential neighborhoods. As a result of the 1916 resolution, New York skyscrapers were um, built with a specific architectural form. They have a bulky base with setbacks and a soaring tower. By the 1950s, New York had outlived the 1916 zoning framework. And after a series of studies, the 1961 zoning resolution was passed. It coordinated use and bulk regulations, incorporated parking requirements, and introduced incentive zoning, which encouraged developers to include public plazas in their developments for additional floor space. In business districts, it also accommodated a new type of high-rise office building with large open floors of a consistent size, and it dramatically reduced densities in zoning dis in residential districts. Since 1961, the zoning code has been continually updated, which you can see here just between 2002 and 2013, how many changes there were uh, throughout the five boroughs. Civitas was founded in 1981 to, as a community-based nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the quality of life on the Upper East Side of East Harlem and specifically focused on zoning. And one of the organization's first tasks was to conduct a study of East 96th Street and recommend zoning changes. This led to the discovery of a legal construction at 108 East 96th Street. And after a five-year legal battle, 12 legal stories were removed from this structure. In uh, 1986, uh, Civitas uh, then initiated our study and video uh, No More Tall Stories, which was narrated by Paul Newman. And our study of the Upper East Side continued as we worked with the new school's uh, simulation center. And we were part of a group along with Community Board 8 who rezoned 3rd Avenue all the way over to East End Avenue from 59th to 96th Street. We've also completed a few rezonings in East Harlem, including a successful rezoning of 52 blocks um, in East Harlem that included contextual districts. And this was the first rezoning in the area since 1961. This was completed in 2003. So there's quite a bit of that time where there were no rezonings in this area. Uh, in 2013, we worked with the Community Board 11 to propose a very nuanced zoning recommendations for the Park Avenue corridor. And additionally, Civitas is now um, an active participant in the Speaker Steering Committee for the East Harlem uh, Neighborhood Study that's going on currently. If you're interested in learning more about zoning, uh, City Planning has a zoning handbook if you want to gain a good foundation in all the different zoning districts throughout the five boroughs. And Civitas has our publication, which is on our website, the ABC of Zoning, 
It's a user-friendly booklet explaining the issues around zoning and planning the visuals and easy to understand explanations. So today there are many zoning changes being proposed across the five boroughs. Uh, these include everything from mandatory inclusionary housing to a neighborhood planning studies and the zoning text amendment, zoning for quality and affordability. Zoning for quality and affordability will particularly affect the Upper East Side as it proposes to increase building heights across all five boroughs. City planning lists their goals uh, for this text amendment is to remove the barriers that constrain housing, to encourage better quality buildings, to promote affordable senior housing, and decrease parking requirements. Although the parking requirements for community boards one through eight in Manhattan will not change since those requirements are stricter than the ones already being proposed. Uh, while Civitas supports increasing affordable housing, we are one of the many groups across New York City that are questioning this text amendment's one-size-fits-all approach to the five boroughs. On this map, you'll see the proposed increases of 20 to 40 feet in the purple shaded areas for affordable senior housing. Uh, this example is some of the more extreme examples of those being proposed. Um, Typically, the buildings will uh, increase anywhere from 5 to 15 feet, but this is one that I think the community should be aware of. Um, to provide the Department of City Planning with recommendations, Civitas has retained BFJ Planning to, re to review zoning for quality and affordability for both Community Boards 8 and Community Boards 11, and we are forming a coalition of community groups. If you'd like to know how this text amendment is going to directly affect the block you live on and how it could possibly increase um, the available um, floor area that buildings can add, um, I would advise you to check up on the city planning website. There are community profiles for every community district in all five boroughs. Uh, and also here's uh, my contact information if you'd like to get any additional information about Civitas or there's questions that we don't have time to answer tonight about zoning or any of our other initiatives, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you to Civitas for all of your great work and your partnership. I'd like to now ask uh, Tara Kelly, Executive Director of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District, uh, to come up, and she's going to give a more focused presentation relating to the Upper East Side and what we've been up to. Uh, if we could please give a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos and your colleagues, Councilmember Borodnik and Senator Kruger, for your support, and thanks to you all for being here this evening, as well as my fellow panelists. Uh, in light of the as of right development threats that Margaret outlined earlier and the Zoning and quality, for Quality and Affordability Text Amendment that Emma just spoke about, and to be prepared for any future unknown zoning changes to the Upper East Side in the city, it's critical to understand the way that the current zoning and land use patterns have shaped our neighborhood. The Upper East Side is 75% residential, and 64% of parcels are contextually zoned. This means that zoning tries to reinforce the qualities of existing streetscape in its regulation of the form and bulk of new buildings. The Upper East Side was a leader, sorry, uh, contextual zoning was developed by the Department of City Planning in the 1980s as an alternative to a tower in the park style de development <coughs> encouraged by the 1961 zoning re resolution. People in communities across the city began to feel the negative effects of silver towers interrupting the street wall and impacting the cohesive character of neighborhoods. The Upper East Side was a leader in this effort, and Friends successfully advocated for the application of contextual zoning to the neighborhood in 1985. Of the residential lots on the Upper East Side, 60% are zoned R8B, one of the most common contextual dis districts, which is com compatible with the typical mid-block brownstone character. Within R8B districts, buildings must conform to the general form of existing structures. This means a base height of 55 to 60 feet and a maximum building height of 75 feet or six stories. 
13% of residential lots are zoned R10, a high density residential district found mainly at intersections of major streets and avenues. 8% are zoned R72, a medium density apartment district found mostly above 96th Street. Other residential zones found on the Upper East Side include R10A, R8A, and R8. And as Emma said, a lot of this information is on uh, City Planning's website if you want to look further into what these forms look like. Another tool used to reinforce neighborhood character on the Upper East Side are our two special purpose districts we have, which were both established in 1973 prior to historic district designation. The special Madison Avenue Preservation District preserves the retail and residential character of Madison Avenue from 61st to 96th Streets. It requires certain uses for the ground floor to ensure community to ensure continuity of retail. The height of new developments is limited by bulk and street wall provisions, but greater lot coverage is permitted. The special park improvement district preserves the residential character and architectural quality of Fifth and Park Avenues from 59th to 111th Streets. It has a height limit for new buildings of 210 feet or 19 stories. Uh, whichever is less, and it mandates a street wall continuity. Uh, no floor area bonuses are allowed. In terms of current land use, we all know that ground floor commercial use contributes strongly to what this area's character. Mid-block ground floor retail is also a unique condition on the Upper East Side, found on many residential side streets throughout the neighborhood. Meanwhile, parks and open space account for only 1% of land use in the entire Upper East Side, a critical factor in working toward the livability of our neighborhood. In considering this livability and what that means for the Upper East Side, the Second Avenue subway, sorry, the Second Avenue is at a critical juncture with the incoming subway and increased development pressures that it will bring. Today, the majority of buildings on Second Avenue are 200 feet tall or less. There are just two buildings taller than 400 feet. One is the Solo Tower Apartments at 427 feet tall, and the Waterford, which is 446 feet tall. Overall, 90% of parcels along Second Avenue are underbuilt under current zoning, which means that there's a great deal of as of right development potential on this corridor. The numerous vacant and underbuilt properties along the avenue also suggest that parcels are being assembled for large development sites. These are just a handful of developments that we know about. Not pictured is a site where zoning lot mergers will allow for a 1,000 foot tower building on the corner of 60th Street and Lexington Avenue. Friends has been engaged in planning and zoning issues since we were founded in 1982. As I mentioned, we were instrumental in achieving contextual zoning for much of the neighborhood 30 years ago, followed by a number of zoning and reforms since then, including the extension of contextual zoning to additional streets. In a 1982 letter to the chairman of city planning, our founding president, Polina Rosenthal, wrote, quote, the present R8 zoning allows the proliferation of assorted needles, slivers, splinters, and other such skyward-oriented structures, which, if unchecked, will totally destroy New York City's mid-block residential streetscape. Remarkably, these are the very same issues that we're confronting today. That is why Friends has commissioned a report by BFJ Planning to focus on ways we can preserve the character of the Upper East Side and make specific recommendations for the future of our neighborhood. Keep an eye out for the release of our findings this fall. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Tara and friends for their great presentation. Uh, for those of you who still would like to learn more, uh, if you did, everyone pick one of these up on the way in. Uh, it should be a packet that shows you just the zoning map, which you can pick up online by googling NYC space Z O L A Zola, and it's one of my favorite websites where you can click around and see what's there. And uh, in this packet, we actually have the pages from the uh, zoning manual. So if you want a copy, just raise your hand. Folks from my office are walking around with additional copies. Keep your hands up until we get to you. Um, what we also have uh, pictured here is uh, a piece just about shadows. So as we talked about the accidental 
skyline MAS showed us some of the shadows over Central Park. Uh, these are the shadows that we will see from the uh, 58 Sutton. And uh, as you can see from this one, this is summer solstice, June 21st, and you can see the 6 a.m. shadow and the 5 p.m. shadow. Uh, I actually learned how to do uh, architectural uh, shadow studies uh, in my job, so that's one of the fun things you're paying me for. Uh, so this is a uh, summer solstice, and uh, this is what it will look like in winter solstice, and that is uh, that shadow casting its way up through the 60s and into the 70s. Um, so that's an entire area of Yorkville that will be living in shadow. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to uh, pass it along to uh, Terrence from Community Board 6, who will talk about um, what your community board can do to uh, change the zoning text and stop the progression of these superscriptors. Terrence, if you can give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Council Member, and thank you for putting this together. I'm Terrence O'Neill, Chair of the Land Use and Waterfront Committee of Community Board 6. And as the Council Member said, I'm going to talk about um, how this issue came about in Community Board 6, which is from 14th to 59th Street, and for the most part, Lexington to the East River, and what we did. First was the proposed building um, at 426-432 East 58th Street, which got a lot of publicity in the press. Our land use committee, which is uh, a land use and waterfront committee, which is wonderful. I have to um, give kudos to all the members of this community board six land use and waterfront committee. We have an email group. We're talking to each other, you know, almost on a daily basis about what's going on out there. So I started hearing and seeing this publicity fairly quickly. It didn't take very long until uh, people, leaders of the Sutton area community sat, contacted the board office, you know, which was the right thing to do and which was a great thing to do and resulted in a meeting um, between the district manager, Dan Miner, our community board, our community board chair, Sandro Sherrod, and Dieter Stewart, who is here, who's going to speak, um, and Gail Hatt, and, and talked about their concern that this proposed 900-foot tower on East 58th Street is way out of context. Um, this is a neighborhood. They live there, and they don't want it. Just to make it very clear. Um, our first reaction, most of us on the committee, well, was, was, well, this development is as of right, you know, what are we going to do? Um, after the meeting that our board chair had, um, the Land Use Committee, prior to this, had recently walked 3rd Avenue, and we discovered several mid-block R10 uh, districts. An R10 district, um, as some of the previous panelists have mentioned, it is very unique in that there's no height limit in an R10 district, and that's where most of these super tall buildings are taking place. Um, I contacted city planning and asked for um, some kind of history on zoning in Community Board 6. And Bob Tuttle of city planning, who's our Community Board liaison, came up with this wonderful map showing where each zoning district is and how long it's been there. To our surprise, there's a district around the Sutton area community that's R10, the entire district, even the mid-blocks, that has been there since 1961. And um, Emma Bologna from Civitas spoke very clearly about how Civitas has changed some of that 1961 zoning in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, then, which is very important, we invited the developer of that building, as controversial as it is, to come to a land use meeting and present. Usually that's what we do, whether it's a controversial issue or a non-controversial issue. If it's a major development, we usually ask the owner to come in and present it to the, to the committee, whether they have to come to us or not. And this being a, an as-of-right building, they did not have to come and present to the community board. Um, they did get back to us and they said, sorry, we can't make the meeting. However, <laughs> as, because they didn't have anything to present yet. Um, however, as land use chair, I did put this item on the agenda and working with leaders of, of, of uh, SAC, of course. Um, 
There were so many people, there were over 100 people at that land use committee meeting. We were going to talk about a very controversial sanitation garage that the Department of Sanitation has proposed in our area, 25th Street and 1st Avenue, as first on the agenda. But there were so many people, I, I think more than in this room, that came to that meeting, um, I said, well, I think we should push this issue first on the agenda. So we did that first. Um, we started with, I started with this short presentation. I showed a zoning map of the area, and then uh, Councilmember Kalos came, which is, which is very important. He came out in support of the community. It's always wonderful when council members come to committee members, committee meetings, and the community board. And basically, we listened, and we saw the passion in the audience of the community members. They spoke clearly, they spoke articulately about this building, how and why, you know, it doesn't belong there, it's way out of context, and they don't want it. So, in spite of our first uh, reaction to this, hey, it's as of right, what are we going to do? Um, we made a decision, the committee, right there in that meeting, that, well, look at all this concern, we're a community board, we represent, the community, um, we have to do something. And um, so we decided to pass a resolution, which is what community boards do. Community boards are essentially powerless. However, uh, elected officials, city planning, and others listen to and read our resolutions, and they can, uh, can make a difference. Uh, so we came up with four points, four main points for that resolution. First, we wanted to, the, the, building department, the building department, to ensure that this development is indeed as of right, that they got their numbers right. Second, we said we're going to meet with city planning to discuss this, and some people did. Um, third, we support, supported the community's uh, overwhelming request that this area is rezoned to a lower density, at the very least in the mid-block, and this proposed development is in a mid-block by the way, which is unusual to have such a high building in a mid-block area as opposed to an avenue. And last, we're going to keep communication open with the owner of this building in the hope that he will listen to the community and listen to the concerns. I am a positive person. I still think that this developer will come to a community board land use meeting to present. I may be proven wrong, but I still think that they will, uh, they will do that. Um, so after that, we had a lot of research to do, because how do you write a resolution on a building that's as of right? Um, so we wanted to make sure that we're on good footing and that we really know what we're talking about. So our full board meeting is the following week. That's when the board is going to vote on this resolution. Um, again, credit to our land use and waterfront committee. Um, I certainly don't do all this work myself, but someone researched uh, land use moratoria, which is, well, one thing that the community wanted. Um, we spoke to Community Board 5, and I have to credit Leila Lodge Seco of Community Board 5 and the Sun Sunshine Task Force. I had several conversations with her. They've been dealing with this issue for over a year, and were much, way far ahead of us on it. Um, we certainly looked at the um, accidental skyline report that, that Margaret talked about and presented. It's a, you know, we knew about it, of course, but looked at it in, in more detail. And we did a lot of background and research. We came up with what we thought was a really good resolution that covered a lot of points. Um, and it's available on the Community Board 6 website. Um, and that's how you uh, state a strong opinion on an as of right building. It also helped that Sandro Sherrod, the chair of our board, uh, was quoted in our, our town, I believe, saying that Community Board 6 believes that buildings should be in context. I think it was very important that he made that, that he made that statement. So I'll leave you with perhaps five um, closing points on what you can do in your neighborhood to um, look at and, if necessary, fight these developments. First of all, act now. And I think there are some, um, uh, there's a lot of movement afoot right now because 
as all of the panelists have been saying, you know, uh, there are many of these buildings going up now. And a good place to start is where are the R10 districts in your neighborhood? Where are the R10 districts in your neighborhood? And perhaps contact your local community board office. We have a nice kind of handy dandy map of, uh, of all of the uh, different districts in community board six because we, or where are the R10 districts in, in community board six because we asked for it. Um, but I think it's a good tool to have. Um, uh, next, learn about land use moratoria. There are several, um, there's kind of a debate going on. We think the land use moratorium is something that you do to study an issue. Um, city planning has come back and said that uh, they need ample evidence to prove that a moratorium is needed. So they need to study the issue first and then do a moratorium. We think you do the moratorium and then you study the issue. Um, but do some research on land use moratoria. We have some information on that. Um, look for signs of lot mergers. Um, there's someone on our committee who's in real estate and knows how to look at the owners of buildings. Often if you look at um, four sites next to each other, they're owned by different LLCs. You usually have you know, one Main Street LLC, four Main Street LLC, and so on and so on. If you look at who, who, who's the president or the managing member of those LLCs, often you'll see the same name. That tells you that, well, this, there might be a lot merger that's, that might be taking place. So until we get some kind of legislation passed saying that um, uh, if there's a lot merger, the public has to be notified until that day comes, a good way to kind of look at it is to have someone you know that's in real estate that can do that kind of real that kind of research to do that in your area and to kind of be proactive on that. And last, work with your community board. Again, community boards are powerless. Um, what we vote on uh, has no power whatsoever. But often, what we vote on does have influence and it can make a difference. The elected officials read and act on resolutions from community boards. They understand that these are voters and these are active voters. And so remember, the community board is there to represent you, the community, to represent us, the community, and the community board will listen and can make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to thank folks who are still here. There are a couple of seats that I've seen that have opened up, so if you're standing, please find a seat. Uh, if you see a seat next to you that's available, please raise your hand and let somebody come keep you company. Uh, as you may have noticed, when we got here, it was really cold. We set the temperature to 60 degrees. An hour later, now it's a little bit warmer, uh, and we're actually wrapping up with our presentations. I just want to share uh, a piece. There's a, there's a, a book called the, 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 the Tao of Pooh. Uh, why am I talking about Pooh Bear right now? Because there's a story in there about the stone cutter. It's a parable and it talks about this person who goes through the cycle where they're a stone cutter, they want to be a mountain, they become the mountain, they become the wind, and they go full circle. And so it's a funny situation where everyone feels powerless in their individual place in life. And so as a citizen, if only it was on the community board, I would have a voice. On the community board, if I only was an elected official, then I would have no voice. And then as an elected legislative, if only I was the mayor. And as the mayor just learned, if only I was in the city council, I would have no voice. <laughs> and so it comes full circle. And so what I would just like to come back to is when citizens are able to mobilize their community groups, and those community groups are able to mobilize a community board, and that community board has a receptive council member and borough president that are supporting them and working together. There is very little that can stop us because it is a community united. Uh, and so along those lines, um, R8B is a zoning term saying that the buildings can only be 75 feet tall. And so the mayor, hmm? sorry, sorry, shorter than 75 feet tall. And so the mayor actually wanted to change it in his zoning amendment to 85. And for some people they said, okay, that's kind of okay. 
But one of the things is there's a lot of 40-foot tall buildings and a lot of 50-foot tall buildings in the neighborhood. And all of a sudden, for a developer, looking at that in that building full of rent-regulated tenants, those awful people in affordable housing, at least according to the developers, it's an opportunity to get rid of that building or replace it with a brand new building that could be 80 feet or 85 feet tall. So we actually worked together with friends of the, of the Upper East Side Historic District, the Historic District Council, and people all over the city mobilized with the borough president. We actually got a victory and the mayor pulled it right out of his plan. So the REP is excellent. In terms of the R10, so R10, as you got to see in all of you have in your packets, that means they have a floor error ratio of 10, which means they can be, if you have a 100 foot lot, you have a uh, 1,000 feet tall that you can build in terms of square feet. And because you usually don't cover your full lot, you're only going to use about half of it, that means you can build about 20. And when you collect air rights from everywhere around you, you start to go higher and higher, and there is no cap. So in the mid blocks, because of the work of a lot of our presenters here, we're safe. They're capped at 75 feet. But we have no context on the avenues except in a couple places. So on 72nd, 79, 86, places where we actually have wide thoroughfares going across town, where we would actually think we could have taller buildings, those places are actually capped at 210 feet. Uh, but if you're on 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, or 3rd Avenue, uh, on the avenue and 100 feet into the block, you have an R10 that can be as tall as possible. So what we're looking for is a change in the zoning for context. To say we'd like to cap it, the highest cap, the highest building for context is 210 feet. And so we can have an R10A or an R10X. The difference in the letters is literally just where the setbacks are and trying to keep it in context with other buildings. So that is what we're hoping for. Also, um, please make sure to fill out your cards. We're collecting them now uh, and during our last speaker because we need a chance to go through the cards and identify the questions to be asked and consolidate them. And so our next and final speaker, we saved the best for last, is uh, Dieter Selig. He's from the Sutton Area Community. Uh, I think it was uh, sometime around April. It may have been for Easter. There may have been Easter bunnies running around. And we were talking and he said, do you know about 58 Sutton? And I said, gosh, no, I think I heard about it. I think somebody took me off, but I thought it was a joke because it was April Fool's. And he was like, no, it's dead serious. Uh, we need to do something about it. And we were able to partner and uh, I talked a little bit about it more, but uh, I now have Dieter who will tell you exactly what they did, how they mobilized and how community group moved community board, a council, a borough president, and how they're organizing with the East River 50s Alliance to make change on their own. If we could give them a warm welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Kellos. Um, so many things have been said before, and I don't have any pretty pictures to show. Two cards, okay. Um, so we want to, there's a little chronological uh, um, line here, when did it start? Uh, it did start in April, and yes, I did make uh, Councilmember Kalos available. I'm um, aware of that, what I had just heard a month before, that a building was to be built. And I brought it to the Sutton Air Community Board of Directors, and they weren't interested, uh, some of them being in the real estate field, they said, well, the building goes up so fine. And I dropped the matter, and uh, then it came all of a sudden that we found out through uh, a contact uh, on 58th Street, uh, one of our, uh, the, actually the uh, uh, president of the uh, East River 50s Alliance that called me up and said, there's something going on in your neighborhood you should know about. And I said, yeah, there's a new building going up here. He said, but did you know that was 900 feet tall? And I said, no, I had no idea. So um, the first thing you have to do is you have to define what the problem is. Well, that was clearly defined once we found out it was 900 feet because uh, that we have never had any idea that you could build a building 900 feet tall and certainly not um, in the middle of the block in our neighborhood. So um, once that was defined, um, I, and I happened to mention it to Councilman Michaelis, 
Um, I said, well, what are we going to have to do to do something about that? And he came up with a good idea uh, that, uh, first of all, he was a resource, which is really important. Uh, you can't do it by yourself. And certainly, a community can't do it by itself. So uh, once you have an advocate um, on your side, uh, you feel a little stronger. Uh, the next step, we had to articulate what our opposition was. We first, uh, when we first uh, were talking about this building, it wasn't a big deal. Once it was 900 feet, it was a very big deal. And uh, then we thought, well, uh, we oppose this building. It wasn't exactly uh, to oppose that building that was the challenge. It was, what are we going to do beyond that? Because if there was, a, even if we would succeed with that building, we're still going to be stuck at um, up the block, down the block, down the street, uh, two blocks down. We're going to have the same problem. That also uh, then necessitated to reach out to the larger community. That is, our community goes on 52nd to 59th Street. So it could happen on 53rd, 54th, 55th, and so forth. So we needed to enlarge our footprint um, by reaching out to a our members that we can reach by email and have a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conversation. Uh, by saying, did you realize that such a thing was going on? And um, it's absolutely amazing how little residents know about what's going on in their own neighborhood. Yeah. There are some people that know everything, and there are a lot of people that know nothing. So um, um, I think I it, it becomes a bit of a, a conversation in the store, in the supermarket, and sometimes, in our case, we have a bulletin board, so we put something on there, and all of a sudden people became aware that uh, something goes on in their neighborhood, and now we still have the chance to say, well, it is, it's not just a block away, it could be five blocks away, and you would still be affected. And there are so many things that affect you. Uh, it's not just the sunshine uh, matter, it is also the traffic, the security, the safety, uh, the trucks. Um, there's, there's so many things that play into it. Uh, there's an environmental impact. This in the environmental impact is on you as a resident, as, as your children, your, your parents, your elderly uh, that walk with, um, with uh, aides, um, with walkers across the street, and trucks are coming around the corner. So we know that as a two-year project, and it won't um, be resolved very quickly. So the first idea is to see, well, how, how can we uh, attack this problem? Um, so the next step was to reach out to other organizations. Um, I had been made aware that there was a meeting at the uh, um, public library on 42nd Street, uh, uh, organized by CD5. Uh, and that was the first time I heard about uh, such a thing as uh, uh, the Sunshine uh, Association that would uh, worry about the sunshine that uh, was going to be taken away by development on the 57th Street, 58th Street, and so forth, that affects the park, the uh, Central Park. And that was a sold out standing room um, um, uh, event. And that led to other things that uh, I said, well, uh, they are already further ahead. They had a study that was a year old. And we were just starting out. Ours was maybe three weeks old. So um, then we had to say, well, if we do anything, we have to reach out to our other organizations that either may know something about it or certainly could join us in the effort once we have some success with it, and they will have success, and we can join them when it is their time. Um, so, um, and everybody was sort of very receptive because uh, it's a it's a cause that you can easily relate to. Um, and so, the Turtle Bay Association, uh, Civitas, uh, the Municipal Art Society, and uh, and others have joined us, um, and, um, and we. We went to CP6 and said, um, yes, you, you have a, um, a meeting scheduled with the Bauhaus people. Um, we would certainly want to come. When the Bauhaus people um, bowed out, um, <laughs> we decided that um, it wasn't um, good enough that we were, we were going to make our presentation to CP6 because that is our community board and we are the community. And good enough, as uh, mentioned before, Dan Miner and uh, uh, Sandra Sherrard, uh, the chairman, uh, agreed to meet with me and uh, my government affairs uh, colleague, Pierre uh, Raff. We had a, a cup of coffee, cup of coffee and, um, and decided that uh, this it, it is important enough for the community to keep it on the agenda and um, meet with us to see what people have to say. 
uh, whatever the outcome might be. So uh, that was the first step, and um, uh, Terry described it very well. Um, there were some helpers um, because um, uh, later on an, uh, an association was uh, formed, but in the very beginning it was a little bit ad hoc. But uh, the people in the neighborhood were organized to um, uh, go down to the um, uh, meeting room where, uh, in the auditorium where we uh, met and, um, and uh, actually confronted CD6 with the fait completed with 150 people, many of them standing room only. And um, they were very outspoken. I mean, they were outraged. And they, were, they let them know that this wasn't um, at all a foregone conclusion just because it's as of right. And some people said well, it, it wasn't handed on by Moses. By Moses. <laughs> and I find right yourself. That was your, your text. Well, good point. We'll to you. So I think that got the attention of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, um, um, like this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, that it, um, uh, I felt sorry a little bit uh, to the representatives of CD6 because they found themselves maybe a little bit berated and, um, and, um, and um, shouted at, and uh, so it, it just was a, a, ty a typical reaction by people who f finally found a way to say something they couldn't have said to anybody else. So the, the public hearings are really critical, and the, um, uh, and the, and the community boards, um, as, as um, ours, uh, community board six, um, will pay attention. They may have no power, but they do listen. Um, uh, the, the next um, step that, um, that is essential when you want to oppose something, you need some professional advice. Luckily, uh, the East River 50 uh, Alliance was formed and some funds were uh, 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 secured so that uh, when you're making steps uh, of such nature, which may take months to do, and it's not like a public uh, uh, a matter of giving a voice to the public, it's also a matter of having the right steps at the right time. And uh, so uh, a zoning lawyer was engaged and a public relations firm was engaged. And uh, the East River 50s Alliance is now the driving force of this effort. Um, we have some of the representatives here, including the President, uh, Alan Kirsch. Um, so with the, with the professional advice that comes along, which we are just at the beginning of, uh, they have to file, file legal papers, they have to uh, uh, figure out all the zoning. You heard what uh, Terry said, it wasn't quite as clear to them either what they needed to do to either oppose it or support it or just be quiet about it. Uh, because not all things are just black and white. Uh, you can't just say, well, we're totally opposed to it and it's perfectly clear. Um, there are people that believe in this world that just because it says as a right doesn't mean it's a foregone conclusion. Um, so the, 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 the professional advice is certainly necessary. Um, um, I know that the people here and, and some of from the, from the panel have uh, told you that there can be success in, in many ways. Sometimes it is so far removed from the possibility of success that this, as I heard somebody this morning say, well, they all say there's nothing you can do with as of right, and, and there it goes, you can do me otherwise. Well, those people are not going to go anywhere with it. Um, so if you don't believe that you're going to win a fight, uh, then um, there's no point in starting. So you, you want to believe that you can make that fight, and when you talk to people in your neighborhood, which you will probably do, because as soon as a puncher comes along, you'll have a reason to talk to them, you'll find out they're more than receptive to listen to you and join you in it, and you must then um, galvanize that force, and if it's in, in council members uh, in Cables' office, or on his first Tuesday, or, or other occasions, uh, do take advantage of that there is such a possibility and you can win. So like-minded people will make the difference, and um, you, you have samples of success, and if you're convinced that you can make a change, uh, so many people here will be convinced to make that change. And it is a long road, 
There are a lot of things that are difficult about it, and it could, may very well go all the way up to the mayor, and we don't know what's going to happen there. But at least we're going to fight a good fight, and we still believe that we're going to win it, and that it can only be done with the people like you in this room. Thank you very much. Just want to thank everyone. So the temperature is still set to 60, but there's a lot of us. Uh, please give us your cards. Now is the final call. And uh, for those of you who are too hot, um, all of this will be online, and you can also email questions. That being said, throughout this evening, you've heard me saying a lot about a certain someone, so much so that her ears have been burning. And we would not be here with it if it wasn't for our borough president, Gail Brewer. She has been a strong advocate for our families. And uh, she actually rezoned her city council district as a council member. Not only was she able to downzone, but she also did mom and pop zoning to protect small businesses. And I'm hoping with her leadership she can do the same thing for the east side. Uh, let's welcome again our borough president, Gail Brewer. Great to work with Ben Kalos. We're both techies. He's much better at it than I am. But I love a civic hackathon better than the movies. So it's great to be here. Uh, it's a very serious topic. So I'm here because, as some of you know, I was on the city council for 12 years. We did a lot of zoning and retail support and tried really hard to landmark as much as possible. So I am a preservationist at heart. And what we did when I first came into the borough presidency a year and a half ago, same time Ben Kalos came in, is we took a look at pre-planning. Every aspect of Manhattan is up for grabs, and that's unfortunate in my opinion. But the fact of the matter is, I looked, for instance, at the South Street Seaport, and I saw the proposal for a big tower, a place, historic area, where I've been going since I was a kid. And we put together a group of stakeholders with the city and the developer and the businesses and um, residents, community board. And we've been, we met, we came up with some guidelines and principles, which is somewhat what you're thinking about. And so far we've been successful, there's no power. So you need to do that. You need to have hope and you need to be organized as you are here tonight. That pre-planning process is really important, and that's exactly what you're doing. We're doing it in other parts of the city at the same time. So I want to say congratulations for thinking along those lines. Second issue is um, when the mayor proposed uh, a proposal text amendment to deal with some of the changes to what I consider contextual zoning, which is what you have somewhat on the east side, um, we got together all the elected officials in the borough of Manhattan, including council members Kalos and Grodnick and um, uh, uh, Senator Kruger and assembly member Steve Wright and many others. And they all signed a letter that we initiated saying, you know, if you're going to talk about a text amendment for quality and affordable housing, it has to be done in a very long time period. It cannot be done quickly. And we have lots of conditions that we'd like to include. So to the credit of the City Planning Commission, they delayed the discussion. It was going to be in June for a vote. It's not going to be September or October. And some of our needs have been met. So we are very clear and very supportive of what you're doing. Um, because it is not something that should exist in a neighborhood that already has a certain kind of zoning. And what you have to be as organized as you are. And so I'm very supportive of your efforts. I know we've met with the Alliance. We look forward to seeing your proposal. Um, I will always work with the council members, and I want to give a big shout out to community board number six and all community boards. Uh, the borough president appoints all 12 members of the community boards, 12 boards in the borough of Manhattan, 50 members on each with the input from the council members. We interview personally 780 people for the 12 community boards. Uh, we appointed 300 and 100 new people. We took some people off. We have been doing forums and workshops on zoning and budgeting and ethics and technology and we want every community board member to be ready for the onslaught of development proposals and for anything else that comes your way. They actually do have a lot of say and I'll tell you why. It's a complicated city. 
Zoning and land use, as you know, and you will learn more, are very complicated. And every time there's a ULIP process, obviously you start off with city planning commission, community board, borough president, city council, back and forth, different timelines for each. But often the issue is, what did the community board say? Because that's where the public, that's where the real people vote and have a discussion. The city council meetings and the borough president's meetings are during the day, to be honest with you, usually, and it doesn't have that kind of input that you participate in at a community board level. So the community board, although on paper it looks like advisory, I will tell you it pays to be cognizant and to work with them because they do have a lot of say, and I hope in our office um, we have trained people, and I think community board six is actually one of the best. So you're very fortunate to have that as one of your uh, input mechanism for our community. So um, I just want to say that our office is also a resource, just as the council members are and the community board members are. We have six or seven people on the staff. They're not all urban planners. They care desperately and deeply about uh, our city and your neighborhood, and we want to be helpful. Finally, we have a letter outside um, that addresses this building in particular and the concerns that we have with it, just as you do, and you're welcome to take a copy of it. Our number, just so you have it, is 212-669-8300, and you can certainly just go to the website, for the Manhattan, or our president, and everybody's email and phone number directly are on that site. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you. And thank you for being here tonight. Let's give it one more time for our world president. We are so So this event must be done by around 8.15. We must be out of location. Uh, so we're going to do the Q&A. Uh, and then at 8.15, uh, you can still follow up with my office afterwards. You can also reach out to all the organizations who shared their contact information. For those of you who live below 59th Street, uh, please make sure to write down this address. It is the address for the East River 50s Alliance. It's actually just spelled out in letters the way it sounds. So it's East, E-A-S-T, River, R-I-V-E-R, -E 50s, F-I-F-T-I-E-S, Alliance, A-L-L-I-A-N-C-E.com. Uh, it's longer, but just spell it out. Go there, sign up, that will keep you updated. Um, and also, we will keep you updated if you have signed up for our list. If your building has not joined the East River 50s Alliance, please do so. Uh, go to your condo or co-op board. Let them know it is imperative that you sign on as a member. Joining is free. Uh, if you have a building where members are able to provide a cap capital contribution, uh, that will help pay for uh, the Euler. So what we've talked about today when you change the zoning, that is called the Uniform Land Use Review Process. And so what is happening in the 50s right now is we are working with the East River 50s Alliance as the applicant. They have hired a zoning attorney. That zoning attorney is doing an environmental assessment study as well as the ULERP, and hopefully that will be done by the summer, and that will move through. So if the panelists can join me on stage, we will do a modified hot seat where I'll read a question, I'll do my best to answer, and whoever wants to answer the question is welcome to step forward, and, um, and uh, we'll do so. Some of the questions we may not be able to answer tonight, in which case I'll ask you to share your information with my staff, and we will actually get back to you. Um, so there are a couple of questions about, so this is a question, we got a number of these. Realistically, can anything be done within the next six months to rezone Sutton area? And so the quick answer is that we are in a race. We are racing the clock. So Bauhaus has the piece of property. They are demolishing the property, but that doesn't actually do anything other than just makes the community feel bad. And so they're trying to do it so that people give up and walk away, but demolishing it does nothing. What they need to do is they need to find somebody to buy the property or raise a lot of money in order to put something together and they have to do a building plan. That is 90 stories, and then they have to dig a foundation, and then they have to substantially complete that foundation for a 90-story building in order to preserve their rights. So that should take more than six months. Meanwhile, today, I voted on a ULERP from HSS 
that they started in February. So HSS was able to do a ULERP in less than six months. So theoretically, we can too. But it is a matter of racing the clock to stop Bauhaus, as well as the parade of other buildings that are coming down the pike. Um, so that is one. Does anyone of the uh, other panelists want to address? OK. Um, so there are a couple of questions relating to floor area ratio. So one question is, is there something we can do to consider FAR ratio, FAR ratio to heights of buildings uh, being considered? Is there something we can do on that? And I know one of the panelists does have some sort of answer on that if you want to come up or if anyone does. Is there anything we can do tying FAR to building heights? So I think one quick answer while the, one of the panelists comes up is um, every single residential district, whether it's R1, R2, all the way up to 10, has an FAR. And when you add that letter on, it gives a contextual height cap. So R8B has a contextual cap of 75, R10A or R10X has a contextual cap of 210. So that is what currently exists under the zoning law. And yes, so it would take a new, uh, a new zoning district to add a height limit to R10, as Ben talked about earlier, and as Terry mentioned, it's important to know where R10 is on the Upper East Side. Uh, we'll publish a map on our website so you can come and look uh, at Friends, which is uh, friends-uess.org. Uh, we'll put that map up there so you can see where that district is. But coming forward, we will have recommendations for its uh, changing our zoning so that there would be height limits in our 10 districts and creating a new zoning district. So this is the one I don't know. It, it stumped me. So the question is, uh, somebody noticed that we have special districts. So Park Avenue uh, has a special district and the question is, can special districts sell their air rights? Do any of our panelists know the answer on that? Does, it, does Basha or our borough president know the answer on that? Can special districts sell their air rights, such as those on Park Avenue? Yes. Okay, so we have an answer from our community board eight member Elizabeth Ashby, as well as our land use uh, person from uh, Gail Brewer's office, which is, yes, the special districts on Park Avenue can sell their air rights technically, which I guess the assumption would be that they could sell them and transfer them in, within the community or within a couple of blocks and that would inflate the heights. Uh, I, I assume that it would be... Basha, do you want to come on up or...? Elected officials are very lucky to have dedicated staffers that will come out to events to educate folks like you and me, uh, and uh, we're grateful to have you, and uh, hopefully you'll get home to your son very soon. It's fast, it's okay. Um, so in special districts, uh, like on the Upper East Side, where there's also the contextual, the uh, contextual districts, the underlying, people can still do a zoning lot merger, you can also have a transfer of development rights from a landmark, However, because there's a height limit or a height cap, you tend to not see these as often just because there's not the flexibility in building envelope to make it worth it to the developer to do such an exchange. We received a number of questions relating to uh, moratorium. The state Courts have held that a moratorium can happen, but a moratorium is limited in scope to a year. Uh, they can take years to win, and they are generally related to resources. So numbers of people have asked, what about electricity, transportation, health, traffic, density? Is it safe to have so many people in one building? How do they get out of the building in the event of emergency? Uh, and uh, what about blackouts, brownouts? all sorts of questions relating to resources. Um, currently, as far as I understand, most of those situations are governed within the zoning code, and it says that 
basically our city is zoned for certain size buildings and it must be able to accommodate the needs even though every single one of us knows that we do not have sufficient transportation infrastructure. But to the extent we wish to pursue the uh, moratorium route, um, we would need to show that the city's resources were insufficient to accommodate the existing planned build-outs and we would have to propose a plan that within a year we could accommodate it. Uh, in one specific legal case, the town was able to get a moratorium because their sewage system, system couldn't handle the additional development, but after a year they said, well, you've had time to build the sewage system, so build it and start and relieve the moratorium. That being said, does anyone, any of our panelists want to, and feel free to answer additionally, these are, I, I'm not a full expert on this, we have the panelists, does it either of you or perfect? Come on. Um, not to put pressure on the council member, but um, city council would have to be the entity that actually votes in a moratorium. So if we all do the research and supply them with the information, we have a much better chance of getting something done. Thank you. So uh, a moratorium is something we can continue to investigate, but what I can say is my concern is a moratorium will take a lot of work, and I'd rather put that same amount of work into changing the zoning code permanently versus staving off certain development for a year. Um, the next set of questions relate to as of right. Why not stop all as of right development? As of right at whose expense? As of right must be abolished. How do we do it? Uh, was there not one agency that had the ability to see what was happening before we are being confronted with uh, faith and complete? Uh, can the building of 58th Street be stopped? And uh, I think the last one was, what legal recourse do community districts have to support their efforts against covert zoning variances granted developers by city authorities? So um, I think the quick thing on that is again, so, the as of right is as of the zoning rights. And what we can do to shape that is adding context. So anytime you don't have context, it's the buildings have this much fair floor area ratio when you purchase the lot, but if you're able to pick up additional air rights from adjoining lots or from buildings in a special permit district or what have you, then you're able to keep going higher and higher and higher. What context does is it preserves the density and says we can still try to squeeze this many people in here, but it creates context in a neighborhood and keeps the buildings from getting too tall. And so one of the questions just being, well, what can we do? So if you're below 59th Street, um, your community boards are already active. And so they've passed a resolution and it's gone to City Planning Commission and if you want, we are moving forward with a private application to the East River 50s Alliance. So please get your board to join the coalition. Um, the East River 50s Alliance is available. I am available. For anyone who enjoyed this presentation so much, they wish it on their neighbors. You can get 10 of you together. We have a program called Ben in Your Building. I've been to countless boards. Uh, all over the district, and I'm happy to come by any night to go over this presentation or a shorter variation of this presentation for your board in hopes of getting you to join and invest. If you live above 59th Street, I'm asking that if you're a part of an organization, please consider getting that organization to pass a resolution and forward it on to our community board, Board 8 or Board 11, which I also represent. If you don't have a community organization yet, I'm actually working on starting one in various parts of the district, including East 72nd Street, where I grew up. Uh, and if you're interested in either joining a local community organization, don't know if you have a community organization or would like to start one, contact my office. You can also contact our borough president's office. We're happy to connect you. In the 60s, we have the East 60th Neighborhood Association. In the 70s, we have the East 79th Street Neighborhood Association. In the 80s, we have the East 86th Street Association. In the 90s, we have Carnegie Hill Neighbors. 
And so there are a group of different associations. I'm hoping if you're a member of those associations or some of the leaders who are here, if you will pass those resolutions and pass those on to CB8. Hopefully CB8 will then have a meeting of their land use committee to consider contextual zoning for our avenues and converting our R10s to R10As and R10Xs. We will need all of you to turn back out at those meetings to tell the community board and let them know they have your support for context. We then need you to turn back out for the CB8 full board, sorry, CB8 land use, uh, land use is a body of the full board that's different than CB6. So we'll pass out of CB8, that will go that. And then we will need to co co create a coalition of the neighborhood associations and find folks who are willing to put their money where their mouth is to bring a private application in order to make changes from 59th to 96th. And that is how we can make those changes. So that is my call to action for you. Um, please share this presentation with your neighbors. If you have additional questions that you think we didn't get a chance to address tonight, feel free to email them to me. Feel free to email them to, if you live in Dan's district, Dan Garoff, or if you live anywhere in Manhattan, our borough president, Gail Brewer. We're happy to work with you. And I just want to, if we can thank our panelists for their great presentation. And I'm hoping to work with each and every one of you to change the zoning in our neighborhood because we can fight these buildings, but we have to do it now before a 58 Sutton is getting built between 59th and 96th. Thank you. You have the power. Good night.